I was listening to a radio show yesterday. Um, I always have the radio on just in the background. And the question was, um, now that we're coming up to the school holiday period, how are we going to feel about um, spending so much time with our children? Were we looking forward to it or were people just dreading it? Question being, did we feel that the um, school holidays were too long? Once again, I can only speak for myself personally, but I have to say I never felt that the school holidays for me with um, my children were too long. I always enjoyed their company and still love the company of my um, son that uh, still remains with me. Obviously, um, my younger son died at 23 months. So, um, yes, I always find those really, really precious moments, even from they were very little. Um, I used to put both of them in the pram and um, head out. It didn't matter whether it was sunny, whether it was raining, whether it was snowing. They were always well well happed up, as some people say, um, coats, hats, gloves, and off we went. And I would have spent the whole day walking. We would have eaten out or brought something with us for a picnic or whatever, and um, thoroughly enjoyed those times. Again, I say me personally, I think the first years of a child's life is very important. And as much as the time goes so quickly, I think when you're young, you tend to, you know, the world seems to be such a big, big place. And the the time people can't wait until they're, you know, they're in their teens, then they're 18, then they're 21. And so it goes on and on. Um, and some people only realize how quickly the time goes as they themselves get older. But I suppose being the sister of, um, or just a, a, a young person who, you know, had a brother who was terminally ill um, in my earlier years, uh, somehow it gives you a different view on life that some people are lucky enough in a way not to have until they get older. But um, living in that kind of environment, I was very aware of just how precious life was, just how, you know, just how weak it was that, you know, it could be gone in any t any moment. You had no sort of, there wasn't a, a time where you could say, well, over the next year, I hear people say, well, in five years time, I want to be doing this. And this is my five year plan. And this is what I hope to do. And we could never think like that. You know what I mean? Because I didn't know what tomorrow would bring never mind five years and just to take that chance and think about the future and its longevity I just or longevity I just could not could not do it but um yeah so I really did uh enjoy the company of my children I love just to to watch all the new things that they would notice and you know like a lot of parents feel about their children um so no the eight weeks in a way for me seem to go so quickly uh obviously at a certain point michael was no longer there anymore but um i i really missed philip i missed the time that you know we could have spent together only for school kind of thing in inverted commas which brings me back to um my own time in school uh, and I think I may have mentioned earlier, primary school. I mean, I just did not like school. I just didn't like it. I didn't like the fact that it took me away from my home. It took me away from my mother. And um, I think I did mention that, you know, when, when I was five or six, my mom and dad split up, which happens to millions of people across the world. But for me, it had a bit, big impact on my life. And I think somewhere inside me, I quite possibly sort of felt... Well, what if mummy wasn't there either? 
So um, I tended to stick very tight to my mum. I um, <laughs> when she uh, went out, at times I used to think I I couldn't breathe. You know, just that sense that she was going to go outside the house and leave me. I physically felt that I couldn't breathe. So for me, the thought of getting ready and getting a new uniform and heading off to school, and I know loads of um, children all over the world look forward to school, that new experience, meeting new, you know, friends and things like that. But the thought of it just filled me with dread. And uh, I think I still have the photograph of the first day of school and this little girl in her new uniform with her long dark hair uh, just looking so sad um yeah I can remember that day very well and it sort of continued through my whole schooling life I think um my memories of uh, school were and I'm sure some of you have experienced that yourself you know when you walked into your first classroom it seemed so big all these tables and all these chairs and different environment and so strange and then if you ever had call to go back into that same room maybe you know years later you realized just how small those little chairs were and how small those little tables were and um one of my biggest memories um of <laughs> primary school for me was um the smell of wax crayons and as you might expect uh, the crayons that I always got to use were you know just the very last ends of the crayons you know you'd always get so many di di um, dished out to each table and for some reason I always felt that the crayons that we had or I had where I was sitting were always just on their last legs, you know, that last little bit where they've been used a hundred times over. And the other memory is of uh, books. Um, you know, every so often in primary school, um, you would have been handed out. Well, of course, it's different now with technology, but I'm going back a bit. And you'd have been given out the books, you know, at the start of class, maybe. And these were books that were reused, but every so often you would get a batch of books that were in that were new and the teacher would start handing them out. And I always remember thinking, oh, please, I hope I get a new book. But I never did. I never did get a new book in all the time that I was at school, primary school. Um, and maybe in, in a bigger school as well, I always got, you know, one that had been used a hundred times you know it had dog ears the um outside of it was in somebody's wallpaper or tin foil or whatever the case may be and I would have just loved to have had one new book put down um and funny I still love books today I love the smell of new books you know I love to feel the pages and things like that which again with Kindle and all the rest of it seems to be a sort of more ID thing now but um yes that was uh that was one of my uh, bains of primary school life as well <laughs> between the crayons and that room three yeah I always remember that teacher um with all due respect to them uh they taught religion and it just would have scared the life out of you um uh, about hell and damnation and if you were bad and oh I mean anybody that would have felt good about getting up in the morning to go in and uh, have a lesson on that it definitely was not was not very um was not very inviting shall we say um music I quite liked music well I always liked music those of you who come to me for Pilates you know how we feel about our, our music and what I play and I think it gives any class that you're in especially fitness class a, a wonderful lift you know you can have as I've said to you many times before I put a disc on or whatever way I'm using my music and um, you know you'll have three or four fantastic songs and then all of a sudden a different song will come on and it almost for me personally puts a different slant on things you know 
So uh, yeah, good music. You can't beat it. Food for the soul every time and can lift you out of the deepest, darkest holes. Um, so yeah, music's very important, whatever kind you like. So yeah, school. Um, but uh, yeah, the big room at the top of the school was uh, usually used more by the uh, sixth formers. I remember uh, being in the part of the school where you hang your coats in the morning and I don't know I still see this person today and uh, obviously she had some dispute with me or maybe I said something I, I can't remember but um, she gave me the biggest shove and I don't know if you remember years ago in some of the junior schools and maybe they still do today you can hang your you could you would hang your coats on these kind of coat hooks, but they were like um metal or um but they were very strong and they were black and you know lovely designed and she just shoved me right into that and it went right in between my shoulder blades and it just took the breath out of me. It was just awful. So yeah, netball. I love netball at school primary school but um again my feelings of netball was that I was very seldom ever picked for the team but it was something I loved I played a few times um but there was always just a group of girls with all due respect to them probably had nothing to do with them but they were always picked for netball any time that I was standing in the schoolyard and it was being played um, so then you had to wait your turn maybe to get on, you know, to play on the team. But it was something that I really loved a few times that I did get to uh, be picked for the team. And I always loved the role of shooter. But uh, as I said, very seldom ever was picked. So a bit of a bystander there watching everybody else. So yeah, primary school for me was not uh, the joy it might have been for many of you listening. Um, I just found it a place that I didn't like to be in. And uh, the happiest part of it for me was um, whenever the bell went and you could come home. The one part I did love was the dinners. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but uh, cornflake squares with custard. Do you remember that? They were just a joy. Uh, cornflakes on the top, jam underneath, and then wasn't so keen on the bottom bit. You know, it was like a shortbread biscuit. But I loved that. But I think my favourite of all, do you remember the jam sponge with the, uh, it had sponge and then a little bit of jam on it and then uh, coconut with custard. Lovely. I loved the pink custard. It was really blancmange, but people called it pink custard. I couldn't tell you about the dinners at all. I remember the potatoes and I remember they always had this particular taste or flavour of them. And the odd time when I've been out in a restaurant, no, I don't mean odd time I've been out, but um, the odd time in particular restaurants, um, I think it's probably because if they're batch cooked, and they end up with this kind of oh, taste of them. I always remember that of school dinners. I don't remember the, you know, the, the main course, so to speak, or what we had. Was it chicken or beef or whatever? I don't really remember that. But the joy for me, obviously, the one that lasted the longest was the, the cake and custard. And I've never been able to even cook that sponge where it had that flavor myself. So it must have been... Maybe it was probably bought in a batch, but it definitely was lovely anyway. And I really, really loved that. So that would have been, if somebody said to me, what was your joy of primary school? I think that would have been it. Um, yeah, so not not much jolliness there to impart to you, I have to say. And then, uh, of course, 11 plus you know, the exam, 11 plus. Now, I didn't even want to be there. So the 11 plus for me, I was just completely switched off, you know. And I think simply it was just, you know, my brother was, 
I was four years older than my brother. And um, he was born with a terminal illness, what's called Aldrich syndrome. And at that time, um, there was three parts to that disease. So it could affect your skin. So you would have very bad eczema. You were prone to infections because your platelet count was quite low. And um, that was, those were two of the main things, you know, there was other things. So you had to be careful of being around maybe, you know, other people that had coughs or colds or flus or things like that. And it was deemed to be terminal. Uh, my brother that was born before me, um, my mum was living in um, London at the time, so he had attended Great Ormond Street Hospital then. And I think at that time, um, you know, even the medical profession weren't 100% sure of exactly what it was. You know, sometimes it was um, different things, you know, because it was so rare, but it was Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. And it's still extremely rare today. I think when I had my two boys, um, there was only 500 cases in the world at that time. So um, I think, you know, being in that environment, uh, my poor brother Philip, his um, skin was extremely bad with eczema. And any of you that have either had it or have children that have had it know exactly how challenging that is both for the person that suffers from it and for the person that's looking after them and I mean my son both my son and my brother suffered terribly with um eczema to the point where um you know you would cream the skin completely you would bandage them up and especially when they're young as well you know because even through their sleep their sleep is disturbed because of it, because the skin becomes itchy. They want to scratch. It wakes them up. And also because, um, you know, there's nothing re really, you can get all these creams and greases and all this stuff, you know, and a lot of them really, really don't work. So it's very hard to keep it underneath, con under control. Um, and then, of course, when the skin is injured like that, you know, you can get infection into it, which causes even more problems. So, the, you know, I, I was very much party to that. I knew that um, because anyone who has a low platelet count is prone to um, bleed internally or externally. So, for example, if, you know, there was, um, if my brother had a nosebleed, it could have went on for hours to the point where then he would have been had to have been taken quite quickly to the hospital because of the loss of blood. So those things were all going on in my life. That was part of my life from I was very young. And um, as a sibling, you're very sad about that because, you know, there was nothing I could really do to help. And then I suppose being my brother's sibling, then I took a lot of his frustration. And that's difficult too. You know, I was a softy kind of person and sad for my own reasons you know so none of those things really helped either so I suppose when I was going off to school those were the things that I was dealing with as a young person and I suppose as a young carer you know years and years ago you didn't think of those things you know if you had a brother or a sister as many of you may have done and they weren't well you just looked after them you did your best you know what I mean mummy worked very hard she was um you know, a single parent at that time. So, you know, you, you do become a child carer. It's only in later years where now, you know, child carers are um, sort of recognized that I realized, yes, that that's, that's what I was in my life um, early on. So the thought of going out and going to school, for some, it may have been an escapism, you know, away from that daily kind of thing. But bad and all as it was at times I just wanted to be at home you know that was my safe place um so I suppose when I was going to school any of those schools um I had that in my head um some people took my quietness or you know a lot of the times maybe not getting involved in other things in school as 
possibly me being snobby or thinking I was better than somebody else or which was complete balderdash you know what I mean I was just trying to get through one day at a time with whatever was going on in my life and how I felt about my environment at that time so it was difficult and then um when the 11 plus came up I mean I had no no notion of wanting to be interested in an exam that was then going to tell me whether I was good or bad or whether I'd won it or lost it or you know the debates that go on every day and I know those of you who may be listening to this have your own opinions and that's perfectly fine I'm not throwing my aspersions on anybody else um my conversation is is with you the listener if you are listening to it and it's just my personal opinion of my life and how I have felt and how my life has affected my teaching um of my Pilates classes and everything else and how I react to the people that are in front of me um most days of the week so um but yes definitely difficult definitely not interested in any tests I think when you're very young you know it's like a lot of things people have issues all through life and then or if you have a pain and you have a pain in your knee and then half the world believe that your pain in your knee is the same as the pain in the knee of the lady or the gentleman or whoever beside you but they're both different pains they could both be coming from completely different areas it doesn't mean you look at those two people in the same light you can't do that maybe yes but you have to think sort of outside the box so I no more wanted to sit down and I would look at questions and even today you know I just have a different way of finding my answers to things and I think when you're young and whatever issues you may have in your own head, it's extremely sad to think that then you have to be told by a peer, you know, somebody older than you that has been teaching you, I'm sorry, Caroline, but you didn't pass. Or I'm sorry, Mary or whatever, Billy or Jimmy or whatever, but you failed. For anybody to think that at a young age like that, that word fail still encourages you to go out go forth and do big things with your life maybe in 10 years time yes 20 years time 30 years time but at that moment in time you have heard the word fail so if you don't have great aspirations for yourself at that time if your confidence is low if you are sad and you have issues in your life what do you think that fail says I'll just leave that out there. So anyway, um, my wonderful mum uh, paid for me, worked hard to make the money to send me to grammar school. Now, if I, <laughs> if I had the misery that I had in my life going on in my own head, I mean, and then... Uh, didn't like being in the environment of school and here I was it was the first year of the school now it was a lovely school uniform was beautiful and everything else and um, everybody that was up at it was lovely and the teachers were wonderful and it was a lovely environment but not for me not for me because a lot of the people that had come up from primary school were in that environment I didn't feel that I fitted in in primary school I felt lonely alone and here I was up in this different arena and um, sort of in the same situation only a little bit older and wishing I suppose that maybe I did like Nip and Tuck and not Nip and Fluff and Dick and Dora I forgot to mention that if you remember in primary school and maybe your books were different but I always remember Nip and Fluff and Dick and Dora and honest to God I couldn't tell you one thing about those two books but I just remember Dick and Dora seemed to go on forever and ever and ever. I do remember almost visually those books and not very stimulating I have to say. You know um, think of all the wonderful things instead of 
nip and fluff and dick and dora that you could learn by going for a walk with all your classmates, you know, down by the sea or things like that. You know what I mean? I do remember sometimes the nature table in primary school. Sorry to jump back a bit. The nature school or the nature table in primary school and it was full of sycamore leaves and acorns. That was the only things I ever remember. I don't remember, um, you know, a lovely flower or something with a lovely colour and it. it was always just those two or three trees. As I got older, I remember finding other trees, you know, in the world on TV or in books and thinking, oh, right, there's more than just the ones we saw. But anyway, so off I went and uh, partook in my first year of grammar school and loved music. Um, was in the special choir and um, was given... Uh, vespers to do as a solo and that was lovely that was very special for me and the music teacher was just a beautiful person lovely lovely person but I, I heard that the, um after I left I left after first year um that the special choir went on to compete in competitions all over Europe there were oh it was a beautiful choir lovely lovely choir and funny some of the girls who were in the choir come to me for pilates now so it's a small world but um yes I competed and were very very successful so that was one one thing that I I was sad that I didn't get to partake in but um feeling that I didn't fit in I um only stayed the year so I did languages there and I have to say my Spanish the Spanish that I learned in that first year stayed with me all the years that I am to today. Um, I did French, but I much preferred Spanish and art. They were my my um, subjects that I loved in school in that first year was music, art and languages. Uh, PE as well, believe it or not, I wasn't that keen on either. I was... Um, felt very uncomfortable um changing around people or things like that you know uh, and I, I'm not very different today I have to say so uh, yeah sad to leave I think mummy was sad that I I didn't hang on in there and give it my best shot and I can understand that you know she wanted the best for me having come from post-war era herself and having to struggle very hard to make ends meet and different jobs that she did. And, oh, that's a, a whole other story and uh, would make a book without a without a doubt. Maeve Binchy, you know, if you've ever watched those period pieces, I mean, my mother lived that life. But uh, fascinating. So, yes, um, she gave in and said that I could come down to a uh, secondary school in Bangor which I did and really looking back I sort of jumped out of the fire out of the fireplace into the fire to be honest with you because coming down from a grammar school now when I say down I mean down from Hollywood to Bangor I don't mean lessening just in case anybody misunderstands what I'm saying um I'm not saying you would but uh Yes, moving down um, was just probably the worst decision I had made for myself personally. And um, because I'd come down from the grammar school um, and I was quiet. And remember, I was moving into second year, so I wasn't starting with first year. Uh, it just... There were certain people in the school who took it that I was a snob. So they misunderstood my quietness, loneliness, uh, home life, you know, with my brother and things like that as being snobby. So there's two or three girls, and I'm sure other people at the same school would, will or would remember them. I won't be naming them or anything else. This is not what this is about. But, um... I think from that until the very last day of school, that girl insulted me, wanted to um, physically kick my head in, 
um, and tried so many times and I just was able to avoid it, not by um, actually being in front of her. Um, they had a special place down at the back of the ladies' or girls' toilets and uh, the girls' toilets were all down in a line. So anytime you walked in the door, you could either see right down the back or you could hear because they would be shouting back at you. So um, you either just didn't go to the loo or you went into the first or second one. I think there was about a row of six or eight now. Um, I could be a bit wrong on that, but they were all down the one side anyway. And I don't know if you ever remember that uh, the toilets both, I think, in... Well, I won't say the primary school because I'm not sure, but I no, but I think that's right. Primary school, yes, as well. If you went into the loo, there was like a gap at the back of the, the panel that divided the two toilets where you could stick your head around. And I think somebody had done that to me once. And, you know, from that day, I never went to um the loo in primary school to the point where I was almost peeing myself uh, when I got home to the front door of um our house but um yeah that that was a terrible time for me um just to have that constant knowing that you know well what what is today going to bring when you go into class you know and uh, who's going to be wanting to knock your head in today and of course I wasn't I, I'm not very good at any kind of confrontation I'm very good at saying to my my ladies and gentlemen and my family well make sure you say that and make sure you do that but when it comes push comes to shove I, I'm not really any good at doing that for myself I'm sort of ashamed to say but uh and I wasn't going to tell my mum what was the point in telling mummy, you know, and, and disturbing her. And she had, you know, so much work to try and do to just, as I said, make ends meet and keep everything going. She had her son who was terminally ill and then she had this miserable, you know, daughter who just wasn't looking back. I just don't think I was happy about anything. And I know I've I had happy times and, you know, good times, but my general feeling of myself was that within I wasn't happy you know what you show on your outside and what you carry on your inside are two completely different things so um yeah that was a big thing for me uh it was a different environment because the grammar school was all girls this was a boy and girl school um and I think because my surname at the time was Spence there was uh, somebody that always seemed to be in the news all the time called Gusty Spence. But for me, it was just a name you would hear in passing. And uh, But it got so the, the guys used to sort of call me, oh, there's Gusty, there's Gusty. But it never occurred to me because, you know, I wasn't brought up in an environment where I would have been aware of the religious side of things or anything like that until maybe you know something happened to you or somebody said something to you and um I uh I remember over a period of like years becoming when I would come at home come home at the end of school and maybe the news would be on and in the background you would hear somebody say Gusty Spence it was so becoming ingrained in my head that I actually thought that they were talking about me I mean looking back at it and then I as something happened a couple of days ago when I was looking up um I put Gusty Spence into my phone and it said banger and I thought well maybe that's why they you know, maybe that's why they were calling me that maybe that's why the 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 girls that wanted to um you know, do me in or whatever, maybe thought I was some relation because of my name or something like that. Um, so it's funny how even all these years later, you know, that that would still be in my head. Then um, I had a nickname of Busty Spence. Um, and I'm putting that out there, folks, for everybody that has been bullied or picked on or, you know, things have been said about them. I could keep that quiet, but I think I have kept so much of my life completely quiet that um, it has done nobody any harm except myself. So I think I may have mentioned in the first podcast about all the stuff that I have sitting ready to write a book. 
But in order to write a book, I've got to put that out there with my hands physically or, you know, type it or whatever. And this, my son, Philip, had mentioned this to me. And it's just so much easier for me just to speak from the heart, just raw and just say it as it is. But um, yeah, so I would go into classrooms and we had wooden tables and engraved in the sides of the wooden table or somewhere you would see Busty Spence. Now, mentally, is that going to help somebody either? You know, now the guys thought this was just funny, you know, and I suppose maybe it was just funny, but to have it engraved, I knew they called me that if I passed down and they were standing waiting to get into a classroom or whatever, you know, the way boys and girls do and the way it's always deemed to be just normal. It's okay. That's what young people do. Rites of passage, you know what I mean? This will help you to be stronger in your later years. And this helps to teach you what life is like. What a load of bull, as far as I'm concerned. Now, as far as I'm concerned, um, I didn't need that to teach me about life. And it's funny, even speaking about that really makes me emotional because it wasn't until my later years that I realized all that bullying and name calling, what it had done to me. You know, you just you just get on with your life and you do what you have to do. And I turned a particular... um had a particular birthday and it just hit me up the face it was just an unbelievable an unbelievable experience because I've always been a nervous person I'm a worrier I'm a, a thinker you know I I never go to bed one night in my whole life and sleep all night so I deal with all those things and I've been a carer all my life that has never stopped you know, it's never stopped because my 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 son Philip, who um, his health still you know is an issue in certain ways. So, but I didn't. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry about that. But uh, I I think I'm I'm trying to say that these things go on in life and they're deemed to be as I said, normal rites of passage. Um, we used to have our break times around the back of the school. Now, I remember a few times, and I was second year into that school, so I didn't particularly know rules and regulations or where you should be or where you shouldn't be or anything else. But um, I remember going out the front of the school. There was a group of sixth form boys, three or four of them, and I'm sure a lot of the other students who would have been at the same school, would or will know them. And one of them I still see, and he is exactly the same as he was then. Um, I won't even describe him because uh, I wouldn't want any kickback from anything like that. But these boys used to come down around you. And it was to the front of the school. But if you wanted to get to the green on that side, you had to go out the front door and they would circle, circle around you and rush you up to the top of the, well, let's say the car park and try and get their hands either up your skirt or down your skirt. And of course me <laughs> verbally saying, uh, leave me alone, please leave me alone. Um, I'm going to tell the I think how pathetic it was. I'm going to tell the headmaster. And they said to me, and what are you going to tell him? And they were quite right. Me, of all people, how was I going to go into a male headmaster and tell him that somebody was trying to put their hands either down my clothes or up my clothes? So my option was to never go out the front of the school again um you know for break time or recess or anything like that so yeah I still see one of those guys in Bangor and he's just exactly as he was then and 
I can't look at him, but I often wonder when he passes me because I haven't changed visually other than that I've aged. I often wonder, does he remember what he did? And if he did that to me, you know, there must I wasn't the only girl in the school that those things were happening to. Surely not. It couldn't have been. Um, you know, does he ever think if he has children of his own daughters, does he ever think of what he did? Because, I mean, as we age, we do think about our past and what we've done. I remember there's a girl in Bangor and she was picked on terribly. Oh, my God. And she's a very, very quiet girl. I still see her around the town. I actually stopped her not that long ago one day um, and said to her, look, if, if I was ever even near company that was ever cruel or horrible to you, um, because I didn't ever want her to think. I mean, there was only one or two people that I ever really hung around with. One of them, God help her, was got by this group of girls. Now, I wasn't on the bus that day, but apparently they gave that girl an awful hiding on the top of the bus. You know, because again, what your rite of passage was, if you were older than somebody else, you were got to go on the top of the bus and all the rest got to go on the bottom. But they gave her an awful hiding, I heard. So, um, but again, that's another thing that comes into my head. I remember... Um, my own son, God love him, being so miserable going to school. And if I had my life to give over, give over again or live over again, I would, I would homeschool my son because he was sad. He was terminally ill. He was um, back and forward to Great Ormond Street Hospital most of his life. He, um, you know, was having immunoglobulin therapy every three weeks so much going on in his young life and then he had school on the top of it and um yeah your rites of passage wonderful rites of passage that people would tell you well that's good for you you know it's good for you it teaches you about life outside as I mentioned earlier makes you a stronger person does it really does it really? I mean, these rites of passage, yes, maybe on the outside, you can tell yourself, oh, yes, they're getting stronger. They're learning. You know what I mean? Stand up for yourself and all, all the, the, the stuff that people say. But at what cost? At what cost does that do to that person inside that you may never, ever hear about, that you may never, ever experience or never see? But it has a cost. It has a cost. It has its own damaging things that happen to people. And it stays with them the rest of their life for many. But I didn't know the rules about a bus, okay? Because I either walked home from secondary school or whatever. But my son got on his bus to come home one day from his grammar school. And he sat at the back of the bus. It was just an ordinary single level bus. And he sat at the back of it. And he was dragged. Now, people in school knew that he was ill. Um, He didn't talk about it. Philip never talked about it. Do you know what I mean? He kept everything within himself. And that's not a good thing either. But, um, and the sixth formers pulled him out of the seat. And threw him down the bus and told him that he didn't, he didn't, uh, that's not where they sat. So in other words, before you go to big school, you need to learn the rules. You need to know your place. You need to know that as a first form, second form, or even third form, you don't sit at the back of the bus. That's for what, special people, smarter people, you know, what is that about? What is that about? And that is still allowed to happen. That is still allowed to happen. I have heard stories, even up to today, about young people. Now, he sat in the middle of the bus, but that wasn't good enough for them. They wanted to peel their oranges and throw their orange skins down at him. Now, <clears throat> as a mother, every day of my life, I spent trying to keep my son alive to keep him well, to keep him away from infection, 
to make sure his skin was comfortable for him to be there when he had to be injected for bloods or whatever the case may be. Every day of my life, and for me as a as a person and a mother, that's never really changed. Um, and then I sent him to grammar school to be treated like that. Can you just imagine how that feels? I still think about that. I still apologize to my son for that. I just... And it didn't... Uh, it didn't um, deter him from going back to sit on the back seat of the bus. He he uh, he was braver than me. Um, <clears throat> but that's just the kind of person he is. He's 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 just a a lovely human being. He's not a fighter. He's not aggressive. Um, and eventually they just he was let sit at the back of the bus. But that's not for everybody. And now, if that had have been an aggressive situation, which, I mean, I think to a point it was, you know, to lift anybody out of a seat and for you to feel that you have the right to dictate to that person where they should sit is just horrible. But anyway, it makes me sad when I think about it. So, um, yeah, his life wasn't great either regarding his school you know he was so sad even going off to get the bus a lot of the time I drove him to yeah to school but uh, yeah those rites of passage and just you know at what cost do we say you'll be better for it you'll learn you know, how to be stronger in life. That's the way of the world, you know, the stronger animal. And it's funny, I, I always root for the underdog. I think if you've been there and you've been bullied and you've been picked on, you know, I just empathize with the underdog every time. I, I can't, I can't not do that. But yeah, those, um, school and everything else like extremely extremely difficult and they get away with it bullies get away with it you know what I mean why because the other people are afraid because you don't want to come forward and be the one that squeals or has told or shows weakness or whatever the case may be so I spent all my life at school being afraid of the boys on one side the girls on the other and it wasn't that long it's not that many years back that I met a girl from school who told me that she was paid 50p by a guy who I remember very well. Uh, used to wear big black dark rimmed glasses. Uh, glasses with black thick rims. Paid her 50p. 50p to beat me up. I was standing on the street when she told me. I just completely shocked. I just could not believe it. I thought, my God, and I never, ever knew that. Never, ever knew that. I think one wonderful memory I have of um, the secondary school was we did a trip to Switzerland. And we got the, the boat, I think it was in Belfast, and we were doing a crossing. And as soon as I put my foot on the boat, I was as sick as a pig. Oh just terrible eventually it wore away anyway then we got a train um out through Italy and oh I just remember looking out the the carriage window you know because it was a sleeper train I think and um just such wonderful beautiful scenery and uh yeah that was a lovely experience uh again mummy scrimped and saved to get uh, the money to send me on that so we went away anyway good girls all with the teachers and we stayed in this it was a lovely hostel down near Lake Lucerne uh beautiful and uh all at our breakfast in the morning all headed out for whatever trips we were doing in the day a lot of them went skiing I was afraid to ski in case I'd fall and break my neck so <laughs> I didn't do that um but there was uh, older girls than us and uh, they used to 
leave the window open as you read about and you've seen in films and I'm sure everybody does it and go out when the teachers went to bed at night and uh, you know just have a wee walk around or go and get themselves a wee drink of whatever and um, come back in and the, the window was always left open for them so two or three nights anyway this uh, other girl said to me Caroline do you want to go out and you know have a walk around the town or whatever so I said to her yeah okay we'll we'll do that and the girls that were in the room of the where the window was that they used to keep open said uh, oh will we leave the window open for you however we went out down around the town came back now you're not talking about late in the in the night or anything and uh the window was locked and closed and we knocked that window and nobody answered it nobody opened it nobody came to it so we had um met these two very nice young chaps swiss who um waited until we got in the window which obviously we didn't get in because it was closed so when we came back down, we just didn't know what to do. The place was in darkness. And then you didn't really want to let the teachers know that you had done what you'd done. Big, big crime. Um, typical that we wouldn't have got, we wouldn't have got to, to do it and nobody know. So the guy said to us, look, we live in the town. You can come back with us and stay the night. Well, I was just terrified. I thought... You know, being a girl that was bullied by guys in school, had my name written all over the... I just thought, oh my God, they could take us away and they could do all these terrible things to us. So the girl that was with me, she says to me, look, Karen, there's nothing we can do. We'll go. So they had this big, long sofa and they let us stay on the sofa, one at each end. So I says to her, look, you go to sleep and I'll stay awake and then you can wake up and... <laughs> when you think about it really I mean but anyway and these guys were in their own room and we never seen them then in the morning we actually got up and left so anyway I think at one point I must have fallen asleep as well when well I woke up I was terrified I thought my god maybe these guys had done something to us and we didn't know where we'd slept through it I mean I was so naive so anyway, we headed back and came down and obviously school had known or the the group had known because obviously the, the other girls had said, yes, they went out and they didn't come back in. Now, they didn't say we locked the window and they couldn't get in. So the word was that we had stayed out with these two men or two guys overnight. And I was just completely devastated that anybody would even think that. So to the point where I um, came home, told my mother exactly what had happened and went in and told the, the, the class, the teachers that, that took the group, exactly what happened. And um, I just wouldn't, oh, I just could not have lived with the thought that what they were interpreting or putting onto it was the case because that was not the case. That was a genuine situation where we couldn't get back in. And, um, you know, you're talking about two young girls like that were no more interested in that kind of thing other than just getting out and walking around and, you know, whatever young people do when they're out there in a different place listening to music or whatever. I can't even remember. That's how bloody exciting it was. But, um, there was no way I was letting that go. And I went back into class, which was or the school to the headmaster, which was a big thing for me, you know, because I was quite a timid girl. And um, I uh, explained the situation, told them exactly what happened. And uh, I think it was put to bed after that. But that still stays with me. You know, it still stays with me. Um, it's like you get the name of an early riser and you can lie until dinner time. There's a... I taught for a big, well, we'll just say uh, what would be known as a top class branch of hotels. And 
anytime there's a discussion on about certain things, um, you know, there's certain people brought on to discuss and give their, you know, advice and their opinion and all the rest of it. Uh, as for paying their staff, crap. That's all I can say. I can remember teaching and waiting three months to get paid. But anyway... So my granny, God rest her, always said, oh, if you get the name of an early riser, you can lie until dinner time, which basically means that, for example, if you go for a lovely meal and you have a good meal and you go out and you say, oh, I had a fantastic meal there. That just sets the, that st- sets the, you know, sort of the, the marker there. So anybody else coming after that, they'll say, oh, no, that meal was rotten. No the early riser and it's very true so I'm going to leave you all with that and um, I hope you have a great day it looks a bit cloudy out there Um, so rain's never been very far away but we can't really complain it hasn't been too bad I mean I was down teaching uh, the seawater boot camp class last night and we were lucky we had relatively high tide the tide was lovely, sea was lovely, and it was great. And our two classes, our Pilates in the park yesterday morning was great. It was a lovely day, nice and mild. And um, so can't complain. Okay, so the sun's not breaking the sky all the time, but sometimes we're not used to that dead heat. If you're on holidays, it's not so bad because you can get away with uh, sitting by the beach and you've got the breeze from the sea. And if you do get into the water, that helps too. So whatever you do today, keep your pecker up, keep your heart up and one foot in front of the other and lots of love and take care. Speak to you soon. Bye bye.